If you live in an average European or North American city, you are probably familiar with these. Massive, usually car-centric developments on the edges of cities with sprawling parking lots. These behemoths are far away from everything else, usually connected to a major road or highway. The public transport connections, if there are any, are usually of mixed quality. Even relatively well-connected places like Zlichin in Prague, Czech Republic take 20 minutes to get from the city center on the metro, which is the fastest possible way to get there, short of a direct high-speed train. Disregarding commercial development, cities overall have been growing outwards rather than upwards. According to this study, called Rapid Rise in Urban Sprawl, Global Hotspots and Trends since 1990, urban sprawl increased by 95.2% from 1990 to 2014. Building roads, power and water infrastructure, sewage treatment and more for these massive suburbs and excerpts isn't cheap. The massive bills for building and maintaining this sprawling infrastructure is the reason that cities in the US and Canada are running out of money. For more information on this topic, check out the article on the growth Ponzi scheme by the non-profit organization Strong Towns. So, the question that has recently been lying on my mind is this. Why do we build stuff like this, even though we know that it's not sustainable, both environmentally and economically? After researching this topic, I found out that there are multiple reasons, such as... Look at this zoning map of Los Angeles, California. All the pink areas are zoned as R1, meaning it's zoned for single-family homes exclusively. Recently, California has allowed building accessory dwelling units, or ADUs, in R1 zones, but that means that you can build a little cottage or something similar in your property, so that doesn't help much. Zoning swaths of cities for single uses only, known as Euclidean zoning, unnecessarily spreads everything out, increasing the distance that roads, city services, and public transport lines, if there are any, have to cover. This zoning pattern inevitably leads to strip malls, big box stores, and massive cathedrals of consumption on the fringes of cities, since shops and other businesses legally can't be built near to where people live. However, this terrible land use is a relatively new phenomenon. For thousands of years, from the founding of the first cities to roughly the 1940s, cities were built in a dense, walkable, mixed-use pattern. This was necessary because if you weren't super rich, you had to walk everywhere. Because of that, old cities like central Paris have incredible population densities. In the city limits of Paris, which mostly consists of older, denser development, the population density is 20,000 people per square kilometer, or 52,000 people per square mile. However, this isn't the only reason. Next up... Buying a plot of land outside the city is way cheaper than trying to build something inside the city, owing to the fact that real estate is scarce inside cities and because more services and more people have access to that land. However, I'd argue that building massive big box stores and sprawling suburbs on the outskirts of cities comes at a greater cost than continuing to grow the city from the inside. The problem is this. The price is paid by the taxpayer and not by the real estate developer, which leads to economically productive and sustainable city centers and urban areas subsidizing the suburbs. For an example of how economically unsustainable contemporary suburbs are, we can look to the city of Tampa, Florida. The city's water infrastructure is aging and in dire need of repair. The proposed solution is this, a $3.2 billion modernization program over the next 20 years, making it roughly $160 million per year. This massive undertaking requires Tampa to increase its water pipe maintenance budget by 800%, which is literally insane. Instead of that, they're planning to triple the price of water and sewage services in the city and to take out $1.5 billion of debt. In short, Tampa's suburban sprawl is bleeding the city dry. Next, suburbs, excerpts, and big box stores almost universally consume more energy per square foot. After all, heating and cooling all those detached McMansions isn't particularly efficient or cheap. In contrast, sharing a wall or two with your neighbor in a dense city reduces gas and electricity consumption, because heat or cold has less ways to escape. There are also numerous indirect costs. For example, this is a map of the carbon footprint of New York City and its surrounding suburbs. As you can see, the vast majority of suburbs emit more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than the inner city because of the sheer inefficiency of American-style suburban land use. Another example of an indirect cost of suburbs and big box stores are the health implications. 
worse air quality, less physical exercise, and more injuries and fatalities due to car dependency cost the city and country millions of dollars every year. One more example of the cost of suburbs is the destruction of farmland and animal habitats, which has implications on biodiversity, food security, and more. There are more factors on why suburbs are so prevalent, like... This applies in two ways. One way construction can be delayed or cancelled is by overly restrictive and or bureaucratic construction laws. The second way is by the obstruction of not in my backyard or NIMBY people. For the sake of simplicity, I'll lump these two into one chapter. NIMBYs and restrictive construction laws are one of the reasons why cities are growing outwards rather than upwards. After all, if you're trying to build something in the middle of a field outside the city, there are less people that will complain and getting permits is also a bit easier. The first one, overly restrictive and or bureaucratic construction laws, applies differently in different regions of the world. Unfortunately, one area where that definitely applies is the Czech Republic. According to the World Bank's Dealing with Construction Permits section of its Ease of Doing Business Index, the Czech Republic ranks 157th out of 190. That puts it near countries like Honduras, Moldova or Kosovo. If you want to build something in this country, be prepared to get to know all the people at the construction office on a first name basis. You might as well book an appointment with a psychotherapist, your mental health will need help after the process finishes. Even if you theoretically meet all the requirements to get a construction permit, you still haven't won. The NIMBY movement is unfortunately strong here and there are minimum parking requirements, forcing developers to either build expensive underground garages or pave extensive plots of land with asphalt. For an example of this, let's look at Haye. Haye is a part of the Yizhny Mesto district, a high-density housing development in the southeast of the city. The terminus of the C metro line is located there and there is a decently sized bus terminal. And this is, or rather, was, the Galaxy Movie Theatre. It was the first multiplex movie theatre in the Czech Republic, but it was closed in 2019 due to falling demand. So, a real estate developer came by, saw the closed theatre building literally right next to the metro station, and thought, hmm, this would be a great place for some good old-fashioned high-density housing. The developer submitted an application for a construction permit, and that's when the NIMBYs, which includes the mayor of Haye, sprang into action. They have a list of grievances, which includes A. Not enough parking spaces. The apartments are literally going to be built right next to a metro station. Do they seriously think that the station is there just for the brutalist aesthetic? B. The tallest coming block of the country, called Kupa, will no longer be the tallest apartment building, and that is a bad thing. Excuse me? Are you serious? This is why they don't want to build almost 300 badly needed new apartments? Really? C. Quote, the citizens of Haya are usually long-time neighbors who have a deep relationship with the cinema and the surrounding area." Unquote. Ah yes, a deep relationship with the cinema. That's why they let it go bankrupt and forced it to close, of course. I mean, to each their own, but I don't think many people have a close connection with the place which looks like it froze in the year 1986, except for the modern brands, of course. In summary, NIMBYs are fighting tooth and nail to keep their housing estate full of apartment buildings from building, gasp, shock, even more apartment buildings. Here are a few solutions I'd propose to help remedy the housing crisis, make cities denser, more economically productive, and generally more livable. Keep in mind that I am not some all-knowing urban planning messiah, so if you have different ideas or disagree with mine, let's constructively discuss them in the comments. First, I would cut down on minimum parking requirements, especially at or near major public transport stations, like train or metro stations. If you live next to a larger public transport station in a city with functional transit, which Prague thankfully still is, you won't need a car for 99% of situations. Second, the laws around construction need to be simplified. We can absolutely do better than this. Other post-Soviet states have successfully done so, so why can't we? For example, Serbia ranks 9th out of 190, 
and Lithuania ranks 10th. In comparison, the Czech Republic ranks 157th, third, and probably the most controversial. It shouldn't be so easy to obstruct construction by various groups for frivolous reasons. I mean, obstructing the building of high-density apartment buildings in a housing estate absolutely chock full of them? I'd get that if they wanted to demolish half the old town to build these, but from all the places where those buildings can fit in, Eugene Miesto is one of the best. And last, I am for the implementation of a land value tax, to promote denser development in cities, and to incentivize reviving disused and abandoned buildings. I am not advocating for the banning of suburbs and rural areas, but for low or very low population densities. People can't expect urban services like buried power cables, wide roads and more, because it is simply not economically sustainable. Because of that, I support the scaling of the land value tax based on provided services, location, the population density of the surroundings, and more. In conclusion, cities are spread out due to multiple factors, which include the growth of suburbs, mass motorization, nimbyism, complex construction laws, zoning, and more. Thankfully, cities are realizing the benefits of building cities like they were built for millennia, and are slowly returning back to the traditional way of building cities. Thank you for watching to the end, you're a real legend. Consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. This has been Tramley, and I'll see you next time. Bye!